Hello, everybody. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about American politics today. Um, and I, I don't always know exactly what you guys um, know, what you're familiar with. So I'm going to kind of start with some basics. Um, if this is old news, you already know all of this, um, then that's totally fine. Um, just bear with me for a couple of minutes while I go over it. On the other hand, if you are confused, if you are not sure um, about kind of the you know, how we think about the, the two basic parties and that kind of thing, then please feel free to ask a question in the online discussion thread, or if you would prefer to keep it between you and I, um, please feel free to drop me an email um, and, and I'll, I'll try to answer it for you. So as you probably know, um, the uh, American politics since the 19th century has been dominated by two parties. Republican, that's what the elephant means, and Democrat, that's what the donkey means. And as you likely all also know, these two parties have had varying coalitions and agendas over time. And the parties as they existed at the turn of the 20th century um, looked very, very different from today. So you probably at least know that the Republicans, you know, elected Donald Trump, um, or that Donald Trump was a Republican president and that Joe Biden is a Democratic president. And you have some vague idea of what that means, what their agenda and approach is. Um, but it, it was really quite different um, in the time period that this novel is taking place. Um, in the early 20th century, following a realignment election that occurred in 1896, the Republican Party was primarily known as the party of business. That is somewhat consistent with what they are today. Um, they defended the gold standard against free silver advocates, so tended to take a more conservative pro-status quo approach to the economy. Um, and uh, they also stood against populists like um, William Jennings Bryan. Um, during and after the Great Depression, um, which was wide, widely seen as discrediting the years of pro-business Republican policies, um, the party also stood in opposition to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, which they perceived as a slippery slope to socialism. So right-leaning on economic issues, that is somewhat consistent, okay? Um, by contrast, the Democratic Party was a really loose coalition um, that included some groups that might seem like they're completely at odds with one another, but didn't necessarily share some interests, okay? So the Democratic Party was made up of Northern populists and liberals on the one hand, so people who were pro-labor, pro-unionization, um, and stood kind of in opposition again to the pro-business Republicans. It also included um, Southern segregationist conservatives. So maybe people who had a somewhat populist stance on economic issues, but were firmly pro-segregation and anti-civil rights, okay? So the Democratic Party included both people with very liberal attitudes and also people with very, very conservative ad attitudes. And that was really the case um, until the middle of the 20th century. You may also know that today, most African-Americans um, vote with the Democratic Party. In fact, it is over, an overwhelming majority of African-Americans vote with the Democratic Party. Um, in the early 20th century, it was the opposite um, because Abraham Lincoln, known as the Great Emancipator, was a Republican president. And because the Democratic Party dominated the Jim Crow South, um, the vast majority of Amer African Americans identified with the Republican Party. And that is a situation that would hold until 1964. 1964 is when ultra conservatives took over the Republican Party in order to nominate Barry Goldwater, who ran on a platform of economic libertarianism or economic, uh, I don't know if we can say libertarianism is the equivalent of conservatism, but right-leaning economic policy and on an anti-civil rights platform, okay, um, for president. And this was partly because um, the Republican Party was trying to see if it could pry loose some of those Southern Democrats who already agreed with Republicans on many cultural issues, if, um, if they could pry those loose from the Democratic Party and get them to start voting Republican. Okay, this was the beginnings of what would ultimately become um, Richard Nixon's um, Southern strategy. So in 1964, um, Goldwater ran on an, a platform of opposition to civil rights. Meanwhile, Democratic presidents like John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were aggressively backing the major civil rights le legislation of the late 50s and the early 60s. And so that um, 
that meant that there was a gradual shift of African American voters from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Okay, so as we have already discussed, um, in the South, African Americans were largely prohibited from voting until the passage of the Voting Rights Act um, of 1965. In New York City, on the other hand, African Americans could vote, but because the city was still dominated by the Democratic political machine at Tammany Hall, um, Republicans were largely irrelevant to New York politics, um, except occasionally when crises like the Panic of 1893 opened up opportunities for alternatives. So the Tammany Hall dominated New York politics that you saw in um, Gangs of New York, that holds true for quite some time, okay? And in fact, Democrats still um, dominate New York politics even though Tammany Hall is um, long gone. So despite having the right to vote in New York, African Americans had difficulty getting representatives of their community or defenders of their interests into political office. In fact, it was only in the 1970s, after the political realignment of the 60s made Democrats the party of civil rights, that black Harlemites would begin to be elected to Congress, okay? So this inability of, um, of, on the part of African Americans to see their will expressed through the traditional two-party system meant that there was fertile ground in Harlem for more radical political styles. While many black elites like Booker T. Washington would remain in the Republican Party and would seek to achieve their goals through the two-party system, uh, many others remained disaffected from politics and started looking around for alternatives. Uh, moreover, um, the pro-business policies of the Republican Party um, did alienate many who felt that it was really just the party of the black bourgeoisie, I mean, both the black and the white bourgeoisie, but people in Harlem felt that it was really the party that represented their elites and did not represent the interests of poor and working class people. So um, throughout the early 20th century, the two um, options that would enjoy the most prominence as we see in Invisible Man um, were socialism and black nationalism. And so I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn. The story of socialism in Harlem is perhaps best typified by the career of A. Philip Randolph a labor organizer and civil rights leader who became Harlem's most prominent socialist. Um, Randolph was born in Florida in 1889 and moved to New York City at the age of 22 with dreams of becoming an actor. Um, that dream largely failed. He did not become an actor, um, but Randolph did gain significant exposure to the ideology so of socialism while he was taking social science courses at City College. Um, he also met a law student named Chandler Owens, who would become his partner in future political efforts. So the Brotherhood in Invisible Man is based on a number of socialist organizations that existed in New York City during the early 20th century. And many of these included the word brotherhood in their name. So for instance, in 1914, Randolph and Owens joined the Brotherhood of Labor, um, which was an employment agency that also encouraged black workers to unionize. Um, in 1919, Randolph became the president of the National Brotherhood of Workers of America. And in 1925, he became president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which organized employees of the Pullman Company, many of whom were African-American. So Brotherhood was a very common name for socialist organizations during this period. It also, like I said, the term brother um, is also a play on um, religious language and on African-American vernacular speech. Um, so Invisible Man depicts the activities of the Brotherhood as a kind of agitation of the masses without an especially clear purpose. We never really truly know what the Brotherhood's agenda is. If you disagree with this idea, then you can certainly let me know. We know that they're opposed to evictions, but it doesn't tell us a whole lot about what they plan to do about that. Um, Invisible Man doesn't depict the kind of efforts that Randolph was primarily engaged in, which was to organize workers in order to negotiate for better wages and working conditions. Um, big cities were an especially conducive environment for these efforts because they brought together so many workers in a small space. Um, Randolph also ran for public office twice, um, even though he did not win, and he ran as a Socialist Party candidate. Um, but the aimless, substance-free quality of the Brotherhood in the novel likely reflects Ellison's general disenchantment with the solo socialist movement in Harlem. Um, and he certainly wasn't the only one. W.E.B. Du Bois, whose theory of double consciousness we discussed a couple of weeks ago, was a socialist in the 1890s and the 1900s, but broke with the Socialist Party of America in 1912 because, like Ellison, 
He was frustrated with the class first approach of many white socialists that tended to ignore the unique problems of the African American community. And in general, because these organizations were working with workers, were working with laborers, um, you know, that is a constituency of people who may have quite conservative racial attitudes, who may be pro segregation, who maybe don't want to see um, African American workers competing with them for jobs and um, potentially depressing wages. Um, in fact, like the situation we see um, in the middle of Invisible Man, where the narrator is essentially brought in as a strike breaker, that was a common thing. And so many laborers resented African Americans because they saw them as um, competing with them for jobs and as being part of strike breaking efforts that were preventing them from getting better opportunities. Um, so socialist parties in America had a tendency sometimes, you know, to capitulate to these attitudes to kind of you know, not pay attention to them. So for example, the Socialist Party of America that was supposedly lobbying on behalf of all workers did not object to the formation of unions that excluded black people. Okay, so they were perfectly okay with the segregation of unions or um, the exclusion of black people from unions, or at the very least, they didn't really speak out against it. Okay, and so this is, this is part of the source of Du Bois's and Ellison's um, sense of alienation from these groups. Ellison also, um, satirize the general patterns of thought and speech in socialist organizations, you know, as we talked about on Monday with their emphasis on quote unquote scientific modes of Marxist analysis and insistence on party discipline, you know, both of which allow very little room for independent thought, you know, everything is supposed to follow the pamphlet written by Brother Jack. Um, Ellison also portrays the socialist jargon as a kind of euph euphemistic speech that the white socialist leaders use to kind of politely denigrate the narrator's Southern vernacular way of speaking, um, which Brother Restrom calls reactionary, um, as well as their distaste for the very working class people they claim to resent. If you recall of the crowds that the narrator gathered for the funeral of Toph Clifton, Todd Clifton, um, Brother Jack says, such crowds are only our raw materials, one of the raw materials to be shaped um, to our program. So raw materials, this is not totally out of character for Marxist analysis, but it is on a kind of brutal way of saying, we don't necessarily care so much about the people themselves. <laughs> uh, we care uh, about what they can do in terms of the advancement of our agenda. Um, Likewise, we see that the narrator does make some similar errors to the ones he's been making throughout the novel. Um, like the college, he views the brotherhood as kind of a path to his personal fulfillment, his personal fame and success. And he seems to kind of mold his values to theirs. Um, he doesn't really seem to understand that this kind of individualism is the antithesis of the socialist collectivist ethos. But this is a subject that I think would be worth reflecting on in, in the online discussion. You are absolutely free to disagree with me um, in my assertion that the Invisible Man doesn't seem to really believe what the Brotherhood is working for, or at the very least, he seems to believe it purely because he wants the Brotherhood to help him advance. Um, as the 20th century wore on, many other Black artists and leaders reached similar conclusions about the white majority socialist parties in the United States. So some, like the actor Paul Robeson, would go all the way over to communism, um, at least partly because the Soviet Union was quite eager to attract prominent African Americans who could serve its propaganda purposes. Um, by the way, there's, there's a lot of stuff on this. I've put a bunch of links on Canvas if you're interested in um, exploring the relationship between Harlem Renaissance figures and the Soviet Union. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, so others would seek to achieve their goals through the American political system, um, and socialism would continue to have an impact on efforts to champion the cause of civil rights for African Americans. So A. Philip Randolph, in fact, would become known as the great intellectual force behind the mid-century civil rights movement and helped organize the March on Washington, D.C., where Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Okay, so... Moving over from socialism to um, Black nationalism. Um, black nationalism is a political formation that advocates for the self-determination of Black people, often in the form of a separate nation, either in Africa or even within the United States. There were some Black nationalist movements who sought to return um, African Americans to Africa and let them have their own independent state in Africa. Um, like white nationalism, um, black nationalism often also champions racial purity, um, except in this 
ideology, it's white people who are categorically evil and corrupt. Um, and it's the black race that must remain untainted by the white. And this is why, if you were wondering, Ross the Exhorter calls um, Todd Clifton the real black man and a natural prince. It's because we're told that Clifton's skin is very dark, which suggests that he has at least close to absolutely pure um, African ancestry. Um, the narrator, on the, hand, on the other hand, Ross the Exhorter calls him contaminated. And that's because his skin, like Ellison's, is lighter. We're told at one point that he's caribou colored, which does suggest some white ancestry. Um, Ross the Exhorter is also almost certainly based on Marcus Garvey, who was the most prominent Black nationalist leader in Harlem during the early 20th century. So Garvey is mentioned in the novel as a figure who had already come and gone, as was, would have actually been true in history. Todd Clifton at one point tells the narrator that their speech will be bigger than anything since Garvey. Um, Ellison also does the same thing with Booker T. Washington, who isn't the founder in the sense that the founder and Washington seem to exist in the world of the novel simultaneously, but Washington is pretty definitively the prototype for the founder. So just as the founder both is and is not Booker T. Washington, um, Ras the Exhorter both is and is not um, Marcus Garvey. Um, so Marcus Garvey was born in Jamaica in 1887 where he got very little formal education. Um, as a teenager, he worked for a printing company in Kingston, Jamaica, and was ultimately fired for his role in organizing a strike. And um, this was really the formative experience of Garvey's political life. And it shows that in many ways, socialism and black nationalism appealed to similar grievances and were therefore natural competitors for the allegiances of working class black, um, black people as they are in the novel. Um, in the years leading up to the First World War, um, Garvey traveled throughout Latin America and ultimately went to London, where he worked in various jobs and cobbled together an education by taking class at Birkbeck College. Um, in the library of the British Museum, he discovered um, Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, and it was that book and his meeting with Egyptian nationalist Deuce Muhammad Ali that inspired Garvey to begin campaigning for the self-determination of Black people in the European colonies as well as in the United States. Um, so after traveling around some more, he arrived in Harlem in 1916 and began um, giving speeches. Um, as was the tradition in the neighborhood at that time, at the corner of Lenox and 135th Street, where the Invisible Man sees Rast the Exhorter for the first time. And this corner, by the way, was literally known as Speaker's Corner. So this was a thing. Um, you climbed up on a ladder, if you had something to say, and you gave a speech in this, you know, big public space. Um, and in fact, A. Philip Randolph was himself giving a speech on that street corner when someone shouted, there's a young man here from Jamaica who wants to be presented to this group. He wants to talk about a movement to develop a back to Africa sentiment in America. And that was Marcus Garvey's first public outing um, in Harlem, the same time A. Philip Randolph was giving a speech. So we see direct already um, competition between the socialist and black nationalist um, ideologies. So Garvey did not get along very well with the black intellectual elite in America, um, though he was actually invited to the U.S. by Booker T. Washington himself. The two quickly discovered that they had very little in common. Um, Garvey also made a bitter enemy of W.E.B. Du Bois, who he referred to as a sellout. And if I, he actually referred to um, Du Bois by a word which I won't speak out loud. Um, while Du Bois said that Garvey resembled an embarrassing blackface minstrel routine. Um, so if American socialism tended to put class first at the expense of racial justice issues, Marcus Garvey's politics were distinctly race first, um, arguing that every race in the world will naturally advocate for its own interests and that therefore African Americans should embrace racial separatism and give up on the idea of petitioning the white people in power for civil rights. So the whole, all of the efforts that um, these other black elites were involved in, in terms of um, trying to um, advocate for civil rights within the political system or um, trying to organize workers. Garvey was saying that's basically useless. <laughs> it's never going to work. So um, black people just basically need to establish their own communities and their own country, their own countries even, and rule them, be allowed to rule themselves. Um, so this is part of what set Garvey against black leaders like Du Bois, who were advocating for equality and integration. Um, the fact that Du Bois and some others tended to be light skinned um, would have also um, triggered Garvey's profound mistrust of people of mixed race. 
who he viewed as having competing loyalties. And I'll just say that this kind of colorism on the part of Garvey, the fact that he preferred people with very dark skin and distrusted people who had light skin, this stems from his own experience as a, ch as a child. Um, I, Jama in Jamaica, at the time when he was growing up, there was a colorism that ran the other direction. So it was more prestigious to have light skin because that suggested white ancestry. Um, and if you were dark skinned, you were considered ugly, um, if not, and, and also just in general, lesser than um, people who had lighter skin. Um, and Garvey kind of reverses that idea and tries to make having dark skin something to be proud of. This is not in any way to vindicate his um, racial attitudes, but just to kind of explain um, what experiences informed them. So um, Garvey's political agenda achieved a strong foothold in Harlem in 1918, when a New York City branch of Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association was incorporated. Um, accepting only members of the Black race, the UNIA grew steadily in the years that followed. There, there was, to be honest, always kind of this com combination of political fervor with grift, so that it can be kind of hard to tell where the like genuine, sincere political effort ends and the kind of scam begins. Okay, so some of the ways in which the, the organization made money kind of mixed ideological and business interests in ways that resemble kind of some other shady populist organizations that leverage the emotions and prejudices of their target audience in order to get them to donate money to what they believe is a worthy cause with most of the benefits accruing to the organizer. So for example, there was a case in the United States recently, um, Steve Bannon, who was a former advisor of Donald Trump, was arrested um, as part of a scam in which he and some other organizers were encouraging people to donate money for the border wall. Um, but in fact, most of the money was going to them and Steve Bannon bought a boat with it. Okay. Um, in keeping with that trend <laughs> of using the money to buy a boat, um, the principal among Marcus Garvey's enterprises um, was the Black Star Line, which was supposed to be a commercial shipping and passenger cruise line sailing between Africa and the Americas that would be completely owned and operated by Black people for the benefit of Black customers. Um, however dubious such a business proposition might have been, um, the funding scheme based on selling $5 shares to individuals who could prove they were of African descent um, was even more so. Um, in an effort to drum up investments, Garvey committed fraud. He um, showed off ships that had supposedly been purchased for the Black Star Line when in fact um, they had not. Um, so these activities of course caught the eye of the state attorney's office who charged Garvey with mail fraud in 1922. Um, during his trial, Garvey argued that not only the U.S. government, but also other Black political groups like the NAACP were engaged in a conspiracy against him. Garvey was convicted and imprisoned and then deported from the United States in 1927. He ultimately died in London. Um, in his absence, the UNIA began to fall apart, but it was not the end of Black nationalist politics in Harlem. Um, in 1930, the Nation of Islam was founded in Detroit by Wallace Fard Muhammad. It became influential throughout the United States, especially in prisons, which is where Malcolm X was converted. And it still exists today under the highly controversial leadership of Louis Farrakhan. So Invisible portrays neither of these movements as capable of answering the real needs of Harlem's Black community, um, which, as we're going to see, descends into chaos upon the withdrawal of the Brotherhood at the end of the book. Um, we can talk in our discussion and on Monday in class about whether Ellison sees any role for politics in Harlem's future.